good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Great to always be great to be back to Budapest. This is a city where I grew up, uh, and then, you know, as as, as mentioned, uh, a city where I've not been living for a while, full time now. So today, I'd like to talk to you about continuous testing at scale. Uh, and before we dive into the continuous, the testing, and the scale part. I wanted to do a little bit of intro of myself as well, thanks for the initial intro, and how some of my background relates to testing. So I've, I've been an engineer, I'm an engineer manager at Uber in Amsterdam, and as mentioned, for about 10 years, I was an engineer myself at different companies, at different sizes, Skyscanner, Sky, JP Morgan. Uh, I'm a full stack, uh, I, I was a full stack engineer for, for quite a while, doing back end, front end, uh, the whole stack, then later doing iOS, Android, a bit of Windows Phone as well. I, I love doing Windows Phone and now the platform is shut down. So I worked at different companies and in different problems and some interesting problems were, for example, monitoring an oil rig uh, and making sure that it's working correctly. It was building trading systems at JP Morgan, making sure they execute things on time on large transactions. Working on the Xbox One launch, making sure that on launch day, things work without any bugs, if possible. Rewriting the Uber apps. I say apps because I've, I've, I've been taking part in rewriting the, what we call the rider app as well as the driver app, as well as working on some of our payment systems and making sure that they work and you can pay anytime, anywhere. Now, because of all the things I've done, I, I have quite a few war stories of testing. Examples of, for example, when we lost two hours of trading data, that was pretty hard to get back and tell our customers what just happened. Or how we prepare to make sure we have a seamless launch worldwide on the Xbox, and so on. And I would like to start with a war story. A story that's pretty personal and that tells a lot about testing, and, and, and one where I learned a lot about testing. This is about the Uber app rewrite. When I joined Uber, I jumped into the middle of rewriting the whole application in about four months' time, and my team was responsible for making sure that the payments worked as expected. So we made sure Apple Pay, credit cards, American Express Rewards, etc., they all worked. And of course, you need to test before you release, so we did just that. We, we tested with our own devices, we did dog fooding, we even had this really nice uh, testing uh, central or, or kind of test pods in San Francisco where we tested in all possible configurations that we could. And we were ready for the big launch and we pressed the button. And right after the launch, I saw a pretty disturbing tweet on Twitter from someone who was working at Twitter at the time saying, nice job, Uber. You shipped an app update that no longer accepts payments. All three of my payments meant to fail with the same error. Seriously? This hit home. This was my baby. This was my responsibility. And we failed. And now the whole world knew about this. This retweet was retweeted multiple times. Uh, people added their opinion on both Uber or the engineering team. And this was actually my responsibility. So, you know, of course, initially we just did what we could. We reached out to the person. We identified the bug. We figured out what the edge case was. And we fixed it. We shipped a hotfix to the app store because we couldn't fix it on the back end and we resolved it. And you can see that's the VP of engineering at the time, Akash, uh, who was communicating on, on, on behalf of his friend of this person. So we resolved it. But afterwards, I felt like this. I, I felt really, really depressed. I worked so hard and yet still failed. And you know, this story really taught me two things. First, testing is really hard. You do your best and still, sometimes it, the bugs just go through, sometimes publicly. Sometimes it's, in this case, it was you know, very, very, very public. But it taught me another thing as well. I, I have been building systems for a long time and I had a lot of best practice. I learned a lot of mistakes. I saw other people's mistakes. And I realized you don't, Rome was not built in a day. If you think of the pyramids, they did not build the biggest pyramid the first time. They first built a smaller one and they figured out the technique and over hundreds of years actually in this case, it, iterating is part of a the journey. These failures make us stronger and we need to learn from them. And this will be a theme that I will refer back to. So I'd like to take a step back and ask ourselves, why do we test? And after that recent failure where a bug made it through in a system that I was responsible for, I would say we test to have no bugs. I shipped a bug. 
it was really embarrassing. Uh, we probably also lost money because of that, because that person couldn't take trips, and maybe they took our competitor. So yeah, uh, you know, let's test the ship no bugs. So then I thought about this. OK, well, you know, what, what is the best example of, of a place that ships close to no bugs? It will be some of the most reliable systems in the world. Let's think NASA, spaceships, spacecrafts. You know, this is the best example of a bug-free code of substance, something that's really important. It has close to zero bugs. Not zero, because we, we know of some disasters, but close to zero. And then I looked into, you know, how do they build code? And there is a high cost to this. They, at, at NASA, software development is slow and very formal, almost painfully slow. They have multiple teams work in parallel. They very much limit the working hours. They formally test each other's hypotheses. They do test after test after test. And they ship very slowly with lots of people. So is that really why we test? And I guess this answer, you know, you should think about for yourself. Like, you know, put, put your hands up if you know why you test. You know, exactly. I see some hands. I'm putting my hand up halfway because I thought a lot of it. And put your hands up if you're not 100% sure just why you test. Yeah, so we have some more hands. I, I thought about this before this talk long and hard, and, and the best answer I could come up with is, is we test to minimize the business impact of mistakes while also maintaining execution speed. So it's like a trade-off. We want to move fast without breaking too many things. On this talk, I'm going to talk about testing of mobile apps. Um, but also, a lot of concepts will apply across the stack. And I'm saying this because when we ask the question, we test so we can avoid. On mobile, the most important thing is we want to avoid that have the biggest business impact. Number one, crashes. App starts, boom, crash. I can't use it. Terrible experience. Number two is functional bugs, when it just doesn't work. What I showed you, that, that mistake, that it couldn't pay, was a functional bug. And on mobile, we also test to avoid UI bugs. It's, it's really, it can be just weird to, to see some glitch. It doesn't do good for your brand. And you know, mobile is highly visual. Of these, if, if you do backend, functional will apply. The other two might not, necessarily. Uh, but by the end of the talk, I'd, I'd like to answer a question and give you a tool set of how can you avoid some of these things. So back to what we're going to talk about today. I'd like to talk about three things on this talk. First, I'd like to talk about continuous testing at scale. What is that scale that I've been talking about? I'll then share how we test at Uber, how uh, I'll, I'll walk you through the tools that we use, some of which, which we built ourselves. And finally, I'd like to leave you with some tools that you can take, even if you know, you're not working in a company like Uber, and a mindset, a framework uh, that might help you decide how to test or how to test better. So let's jump in. What is this scale thing? And the best way to illustrate scale is to talk a little bit about uh, Uber uh, and, and how it grew. And this is the Uber team back in, I think, seven years ago, three engineers. You know, when you ask how many people does it take to write the first version of Uber, this is the answer. And that's the team hard at work uh, getting ready for a release. And then the team grew. This is just the mobile engineers. In about five years, it grew from one-person team to 100-person team. This is just, again, the mobile engineers. And Uber, by the numbers today, it's at more than 600 cities. I say cities because every city might have a set of different features. More than 65 countries, six continents. We have 10 different engineering offices where engineers uh, work, one of which is Amsterdam, the biggest one outside of, of Europe. And Uber has more than 18,000 people working for Uber, of which more than 2,500 engineers and more than 400 mobile engineers, a huge number. And this is, again, in, in, in about eight years' time. So you might pause, hundreds of mobile engineers, why would you need this many? And I, I just want to reflect on, on how things just get complex over time. So with Uber, you can request a ride. That's when you, you use the app, and that's the most common part that you do uh, when we have two apps for that. You can drive with Uber. Uh, we also have two apps to do so. We're in a bunch of countries and cities, so things will get more complex naturally. And then Uber is not just about rides. It's about eats, fried, bike, rental, self-driving. There's a bunch of other parts. But you might still think, wait, why do we need hundreds of engineers? This, this might be tens of engineers. 
Well, each of these areas is a bit more complex. When your requests arrive, there's things like scheduled rides. We have airport pickup functionality for each city. Uh, you can pay by cash in a lot of uh, the cities. There's a lot of fraud that we need to detect, and the list goes on and on. My team is responsible for over 10 ways to pay at Uber, and we have about 12 people who build of that, of, of that functionality worldwide. So there's a lot of small teams who do smaller and, and bigger things. Same thing when you drive with Uber. There's Uber Pool. Maps is super important. We have safety features. Uh, we have this really cool thing called Beacon that you, it's a sticker, you put it on your your uh, car shield, and when you come out from the from a club at night, your Uber will be the one that beams uh, green. So now we have a lot of engineers working on a lot of things, and now we need a lot more engineers to help these engineers work productively. We have a team just on app performance, a team just on our networking stack. Uh, and then, of course, we have, this was just a rider app or the driver app, and we have a lot of other apps. So it just all adds up, all that functionality and all, all those different things that we're doing. So, you know, this is Uber at scale. But what can at scale really mean? It can mean a lot of things. More functionality, more users, more code, and so on. All of these, basically, when you grow, you need to scale at some point. And scale, it, it can be going from one engineer to three engineers is a, is a scale. Going from one to 1,000 is a different scale. All of these, when you scale, you get problems. And I'm just going to talk about some of the most common problems that, that you'll probably see. With more functionality will come more bugs. You just have more area to cover, and you will likely miss some. With more users, regions, and locales, you will have some of those bugs that were really small when you were a startup or you had a few customers. They might impact thousands of people, and you cannot ignore them anymore. With more code, your build times will be longer. What used to take 10 seconds to build with a couple thousand lines of code, with 100,000 or a million lines of code, will definitely take longer. Extreme cases, it can take minutes. And now we have a lot of engineers who need to communicate, and they need to do code reviews, and it'll just take longer time to get things done. Uh, who here works at a company, uh, put your hands up please, uh, of 100 people or less? All right, and, and those with 100 people or more? Yeah, so a lot of you have probably felt what it's like that sometimes it takes longer to get things done, and that comes with scale. When you have more locations, and more time zones. Your systems need to work 24 seven. Your CI cannot be down in the middle of the night in your headquarters, let's say for us in San Francisco, because people in Amsterdam cannot work. You write more tests, but those tests take a lot longer time to run. And when you have more apps, the same problems just keep repeating again and again. And the way I just think about scale with, a, with, a, with something that's outside of, of tech is, let's say you're in charge of building a house or two houses in a village. And you'll probably do a lot of the building by yourself. You'll probably hire some contractors. You'll do the plan yourself. You will know the basics of how to build a house. And then as, as you become more successful, you end up building a city. And the same concepts apply, but a lot of new concepts come in. Logistics will be important. Inventory management will be a lot more important. Building a skyscraper will not be the same as building a small house. And that's really how I think about scale. It's, it's going from the small, small village to, to this big city and everything in between. And you don't get here from one step to the other. That, that city also has some chaos to it that happened in the process. So that's some thoughts on scale. And let me show you how we do testing at Uber. Now keep in mind that we are at a far end of scale. We grew really fast to quite big. There are bigger companies than Uber, uh, which are in the same league. So what you will see us doing might not apply to your company that's a bit smaller, or it, it might, and I, I will get to that in, in the last part. So before I go into, into the, the details, I'd like to mention a few different things that I found different at Uber compared to where I worked previously, Skyscanner, Skype, and so on. First at Uber, we have no QA role. There is no such role as a QA. We do have no testing teams. We have no dedicated DevOps team. We have engineers who split this responsibly, and we have teams who do this, but no single team owns these things. What we do have is we have a dedicated teams owning the infrastructure for testing and developer tooling. They don't write the tests. They, they only build the infrastructure and make sure it works all the time, 24-7. We also have a bit more formal planning process, which means that before we start developing, we have a little bit of plan circulated. And this is the one thing that we always stick to. 
And finally, we have no staging systems. So with the one we find, we have no staging systems. We have something called <clears throat> test tendencies instead that I'll talk a bit more about. And we have, we have a blameless postmortem culture that we also touch on and how it relates to testing. So how do we test? We do a bunch of different stuff with a bunch of different systems to get code to production. But the three main parts are we write the code, we get it into master, uh, we, we do master-based development, we do some testing before we release to the wild, and then we just ship to our users. So let me go through specifically what we do at each of these phases, starting with when you write the code to when it gets into the master branch. We use something called Fabricator and, and Arcanist. So we first create a pull request. We run this arc diff command, which tells Arcanist, hey, I want to create a pull request. This, this runs a bunch of local validations, simple ones, but ones where it says your commit message needs to have a test plan, else you cannot continue. It needs to have a revert plan, else you cannot continue. Very simple, but very effective. And it does local linting. And I'll talk about linting in a little bit. That's a, that's a big thing that we do. Then we create something called a diff, which is basically a pull request. And we have some things called, uh, some automated rules run on this pull request immediately that are called herald rules. And these rules are things like, if some of these files are touched, add these reviewers. Or if, if, if you mention certain things, or if you write something, some regular expression, add some sort of comments to the diff. And I'm gonna show you in a, in a minute what this actually means. At the same time, our continuous integration kicks off. We do linting, unit tests, static code analysis, and this goes back to this pull request, if you will, the diff. We just call it diff internally. And the reviewers come in and they do a code review. So I want to just touch on those herald rules and how this works in practice. So this is the Fabricator user interface, and this is me creating a diff, a pull request, saying I want to make these changes, and the changes are not the important part. I specified I want these two people to, to be my reviewers. And as soon as I created my diff, some automated rules were ran. Herald, this rule engine, noticed that I have touched some core payments code, which actually, funny enough, my team owns. And it adds a comment saying, hey, before you, you, you proceed, these are core files. You need to have someone review this code. And it needs to be someone from a payments team. It also, it also gives me a warning. Hey, I see you. you you have something with subscribe on. There are certain ways you need to do that. That's a warning. You should keep that into account. And these herald rules behind the scenes, they're pretty easy to set up with Fabricator. Here's an example. You basically, here, here's a rule that we set up saying, if you check into the Android code base and you have the subscribe annotation, we will add a comment advising you to use data streams instead of this, this old school uh, thing in our case. And we have a lot of these rules. They're really, really powerful. You've, you've not had a single person touch this, but you're already getting the wisdom of, of the crowd, or in this case, the wisdom of our engineering team. Second, um, linting. I, I mentioned we do linting. We do a lot more than lint, linting. Linting is part of the Uber's engineering culture. It's a first-class citizen. Since about six years, so maybe two years into when the company was founded, we started to put in lint rules. And before Uber, I thought linting was all about spaces and tabs and just automatically formatting. We took it to the next level of just having semantics. And whenever we have some best practices in architecture, we try to write a lint rule. Let's say from a presenter, you should only invoke views but not interactors. We probably have a lint rule for that, that if a file named presenter call something called interactor, it, it might give you a warning that you would have to suppress. And we take it so seriously that we built a, a, a linting platform that we open source as language agonistic. An example lint rule is one of our engineers put this into our test files. This was a person in my team. They noticed that some test uh, just created a new instance of static theme stream. But in fact, we have a variable because we, we probably use something that you could just use instead. So we just quickly coded up a linting rule, and anyone who ever tries to you know, use one of these things in those specific tests will get a lint error and cannot proceed. This works really, really well at scaling Uber's engineering. The first day I joined, uh, the second day I, I wanted to check in some code. It took me two days to check in because I was getting these linting errors all the time. I was overriding the conventions. I wasn't aware of them, and it taught me really quickly. I hear the same thing from new starters. It's really hard to get started with Uber landing code, but it's really, you get a safety net even without any code reviews. So this worked really well for us. So yeah, you have your 
uh, we've still not landed the code. You, you get linting, you build, you test, you sometimes update your pull request, and then you say, I'm ready to put this into master. And in fabricator land, you call this landing. All right, let's merge to master. Uh, before, we don't merge directly to the code re repository. We used to do this, but again, with scale, we saw a lot of people merging in at the same time, and we had the, the master failing. So we have a system that makes sure that runs its own continuous integration. It runs some additional tests that take longer, and only when things are 100% working, uh, it pulls the results back, and it checks into the code repository. This will make sure that only one code at a time will land in there, and we optimize this build system to make sure it runs fast, we have parallel machines, we split up the test, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I won't go into too many details. And just one thing about the build speed. I mentioned we have a team whose main role is, is, the, is to own this infrastructure. They measure every single one of our builds, and they get paged at the middle of the night when things are, well, maybe not the middle of the night. If things are down, they do. But if our, our build is slow, they, they start to fix it. So if your team ever grows to this size, you know, don't forget. If you, wanna, if you have a problem, just measure it and, and, and fix it as such. Cool. Well, that was a lot of steps, you know, just to get stuff into master. Some local checks, continuous integration, code review, and, and then the state merging to master. Right, it's a master. We are ready to almost release. But we need to test some stuff, especially with the mobile application. So we do a build cut with mobile. We probably do this once a week. And we have a release candidate. And we need to do some stuff before we can get into production. So what do we do? Well, we, of course, run the automated tests. We might have some more extensive tests, and those just run UI tests, unit tests, uh, uh, integration tests, et cetera. Then we do the manual testing. Now, this is unique to mobile. I've been thinking, can we ever get rid of manual tests? And my answer is probably not. Uh, but we do manual tests in a very interesting way. We tell the teams, every, I told you we don't have a QA role. We don't even have QAs. Every team is responsible for their manual tests. And you can see, this is our, we have an interface that our team built, a place where the teams can say, here's the manual test I want to do every single week. It says, I want to do manual tests. And, and you specify it. And, and you just fill out simple forms saying, you know, here's what you, you click and here's what I expect. We, put the, we, we, we scaled our, our testing because so my team actually, you can see, has quite a few manual tests that we just decided not to automate. Maybe we could. In case of payments, sometimes it's more difficult, but we, we just don't. And again, sometimes these teams might work with, uh, w might decide that we use some crowdsource testing to do it, but teams are incentivized. Decide what you want to test manually and do it every week or automate it. That's their decision. Now, when it comes to manual testing, and you will, whenever you have an app, you will test it either locally or, or, or regularly. There's an interesting question. How do you are you going to test your production system, your test system? And this is where something called test tenancy comes in that, that I, I found really interesting at Uber. Uh, put your hands up if you know what a staging and production system is. Cool. And, and, and your hands up if you know what a test tenancy is? Yeah, I, I didn't know it until I started at Uber. So the classical way of testing is, is you have your code, you have a staging system and a production system, test accounts in staging, production accounts in production, and you sometimes update your production system into staging, so you have kind of real data. Then you push the code, you first put it in, into staging, and you, you test, you know, is this thing working? And yes, it is. Cool, let's go to production. It's very nice and clean. Now, later, you'll have more systems, microservices, and a lot. This is all back -end, usually back-end systems, by the way, uh, that your app works with. And, and then you just have to do the same thing, and you have to keep refreshing and making sure your systems work with that. So in, in our backend systems, and I, I said I'll talk about mobile, but actually this is pretty important for mobile. So when on mobile we want to test, we have something different. We still have the code. We have one production system, and both test and production accounts use this system. What we do here is we have two tenancies called a production and a test tenancy. You can kind of think like we have a, an account and it has a tag saying type, and if it says test, then there's a test tenancy. Every single system is responsible to treat test tenancies as they should. An example, in case of payments, if we see as a test account, we actually don't try to talk to the bank. We always reply as success, uh, unless there's some sort of overriding. And what we want with this is simplicity, because we only have to deploy to one place. What we've lost is the ability to see, is our code working? Which is why we do a stage rollout. We will slowly roll out to the whole population, and we'll see if this thing works. 
So we're no longer optimizing to know if our rollout will be successful, which is kind of counterintuitive. But actually, it's not when you grow. When you have a lot of services and microservices, being able to deploy to one single place beats the fact that you don't have a staging environment. In fact, if you imagine having 1,000 microservices in the other model, you would have, a, a thousand, you have, you would have a thou, twice as many systems that need to be updated and synchronized, and they have, the staging systems have to talk with each other, and what if one of them is out of date? It's a, it's a disaster waiting. So we've decided to go with test tendencies, and when we have lots of services, it's an interesting model. It's a lot harder to get it right, though. And some of our systems had to be worked with extensively to make sure they support this model. So yeah, you have your manual tests. That succeeded. Uh, then we do dog fooding. It's a big part of Uber. Uh, our app just lends itself to dog fooding. We give employees credits. And when you start the app and your employee, you say, hey, you need to test our beta app. And we do some stuff that when you see you're an employee, whether you're using the beta app or not, whenever you take a screenshot, you have our custom bug reporter tool filed, which leads to a ticket which teams can then triage and decide, hey, is this important enough for me to say stop the release or not? So yeah, we have dog fooding. We have crash reports. Uh, we use some third party systems. And we've, we've now started to, to a bit move into our, our own to get automatic alerting. And you know, sometimes these checks don't, sometimes you, you get something. Uh-oh, something happened. So in that case, we just do a fix. We land as the master. Uh, and then we do a hotfix process where we merge this into a release candidate. And, and then sometimes we have to rerun the whole checks. It, we just use our best judgment. And then we do things like localization and a bunch of other stuff. And if all of these succeed, we are ready for release. And these steps can, can be different for your organization. It used to be a lot fewer for us. For some apps, it's more. For some apps, it's less. Uh, we, we built a tool uh, internally to visualize this a bit better. So this is the screenshot of that. Uh, whenever we do a, a build, uh, we know, you know exactly where the state is. For example, you can see that this build has some blockers. We cannot release it. Someone maybe on dogfooding said, uh-oh, I need to fix this before we can do this. And again, with scale, you, when you have tens of teams or even more doing stuff, you somehow want to have some overview of what's going on. Phew, uh, that, was, that was a lot of stuff as well, just to get into previous and testing. Luckily, we're, we're close. We can almost ship to users. It's working. We've tested it. Uh, and, and yeah, so mobile rollouts can be a little bit different. Bugs will be introduced when none of your previous uh, tests have caught it. That was my example. I, uh, we tested on the mobile rack, all the devices. We still had a bug. And with native apps, new builds take days to ship due to the app store approval, and people will not even update them. So if you have a bug there, it will stay for at least days, and for people who don't update, a lot longer. So you know you can toss this or any way you want. If you want to make sure you can fix your bugs, they need to be revertible remotely. And we decided to use back and control feature flags in our mobile code base. So the way this works in practice is we have some if conditions in the code, if certain flags are there, and we have a tool where we can roll back this these features, we have background push notifications to make sure it gets to all, all devices. And yeah, we just use this for remote bug fixing. Barely use it, but sometimes we have to. It, 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 bugs just make it through. Now, aside from, from bugs, we release some, some new stuff. Uh, we, do, we don't want to have business impact. And for Uber, the biggest business impact is people taking trips. We might build a shiny new feature, and people are taking less trips, which is not what we wanted. So we always do a stage rollout. Uh, we, we control user exposure via some sort of feature flags, and then we monitor the impact of business metrics. And what we do, you know, it's ready for production. We do a stage rollout. We monitor. Is it OK? Yeah. Then, then we carry on the rollout. If not, we stop. We pause. And here, this is where we have our data science team help us a lot with uh, helping us figure out, all right, we're going to have, we're going to show two. This, this, this is, as part of stage rollout, we, we, we show the feature that we want to roll out versus we don't show it. We work with our data science team to make sure we're not cheating, like uh, that things are unchanged. The, the important business metrics, there's some sort of algorithms going on, uh, and we figure out when the results are statistically significant. If we see things are good, we carry on rollout. We did not used to do this when we were small, but with us releasing a lot of new features every week, we're trying to do this. And of course, our data science team needs to make sure we have experiments that, are, that don't inf infer with each other. 
After all that, we do some, some, some things I'll just let's zoom through. We monitor our events even on mobile. We use some machine learning to, to detect anomalies and see if things are, are not the way they should be. We do performance monitoring. We, we sample some of the mobile devices to see you know, how fast this is results from one of the methods that I just selected that was a bit slower running method to see how fast or slow they are certain devices, especially older ones. And uh, within a set of metrics, you know, which, which, which methods are the slowest. You can see our, our sampling approach. We run these pretty randomly. We don't want to load people's phones because uh, there's there. But when it comes to performance testing in a lab, it's hard to do. In the real world, it's easier. So yeah, that's really kind of our, our rollout strategy. Stage rollout, monitoring alert, alerting. We have some crash reports and some business events and some performance. So you know, just to sum it up, what we do, we do a bunch of code and functional checks before we land to master. We then do a build cut. We then do a bunch of functional UX and quality checks and then do some hot fixes if needed before we're ready for a release. And when we're ready for that release, we do stage rollout and we monitor and things are out and they're in production and that's it. You know, we're, oops, I, 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 uh, I went ahead, but are we done testing? And I would say maybe, but then you remember my example. Uh, we released, and I, I was not aware that my feature had a pretty big bug. I was like this dog, you know, sitting in the middle of a fire and this is fine. Things will catch fire. After you release, things will go bad. And, and things, an outage will happen, basically. And it might be something you release and something you haven't. A really important testing is what you do at this point. And this is why I, I talked about postmortems being part of an important part of, of, of Uber. We, we have this thing called blameless postmortems. So when bad things happen, we don't name people. We don't look at who wrote the code. We look at where did the system fail. The goal of the postmortem is to understand the real root cause. And by root cause, I don't just mean, you know, like, like oh, I, we should have done an extra code review. And we also want to take action to prevent these things happening, the same issue, and impact our customers again. In that example, when we shipped a broken payment feature, that root cause does not happen again because we found the issue and, and, and we've, we put a systematic place, fix in place. A part of our postmortem process is we ask five whys. This is a method where you ask, why did this happen? Well, it happened because of this reason. Why did that reason happen? Well, it happened because of this other reason. Why did that happen? This method is, I think there's some studies saying you actually can get to root cause after finding, asking these five questions. And once this happened, we, we fixed our systems. We, we put in extra checks if need be. We tried to be pragmatic, not slow things down. But a lot of times, root causes are a bit like this, or they used to be. We didn't do proper planning. We just forgot about that. We didn't test for this edge case, or we didn't have a test plan. A really, really important part of testing is that it all starts with your requirements planning. A lot of our fixes are to do with how do we do planning, and how do we do our specification? Do we have a testing plan? We used to not have testing plan in the early days. I can tell you, we have a testing plan every time before we launch a feature, just because, not because we think it's great, because we found out that's what we should be doing. So yeah, uh, if you want one big picture that I'm not going to talk through about the mobile testing lifecycle at Uber, this is it. Uh, it's a bunch of different steps. And you know, it's... And now I, I'd like to talk about some tools that you can actually use, because that big thing that you saw that I just talked through, the thing that works for us, it will not work for you. It will not work exactly for you. You're a different company, either a smaller company, a bigger company, different teams, different industry, different growth. So, you know, hopefully I give you an understanding of why we got to where we were, but I, I, I want to give you some, something to walk away with. And, and this is, you know, let's go back to the original. Why, why do we test? Minimize the business impact. And the business impact on mobile, you know, for your own, own company where you work, you can replace this with something else. But for mobile, the tools that I talk through, we use at Uber, it's crash reports, crash report alerting for crashes, we do, for functional bugs, we do things like code reviews, unit testing, manual testing, dog fooding, stage rollout. It's not a complete list for UI testing, manual testing, dog fooding, screenshot testing. Now, I, I showed you a lot of custom tools that uh, we use for this one. And then there's some other things that are specific, for example, to Uber. Business monitoring and alerting is pretty specific to us. You might not need it. Performance monitoring, very specific to us. We have so many users and in, in low and under devices, and it makes the monetary difference to us. We know that every second longer the app starts to load, we lose certain revenue. So yeah, 
This is where you, you, know, you, you want to put in what, is, what matters to you. And I don't want to just, just say like, hey, I showed you all the cool stuff that we built custom at Uber. Some of it might be open source, but the rest, you know, tough luck. But I showed you nice images. So, I, so some of my personal recommendations and some of the things that I talk with some of our, our teams who build the tools of what we either used to use or, or have used. And again, not an extensive list. This is just to give you some names. Crash reporting, Crashlytics is, is, is great. It's free. We still use it in our app today. For code reviews, GitHub, if you want to do an in-house fabricator, or you can do some other tools again. Continuous integration, a bunch of stuff off the shelf, like Bitrise, a local startup from Hungary, but they're international. If you want to do it in-house, use Jenkins. That's what we use. Again, you can use Jenkins. Manual testing, you still want to do it. If you don't, if you don't have a QA uh, a team like we do, crowdsourced. Uh, finding UI bugs, we use XT Test and Expresso. Um, we also use screenshot testing and some other things. Analytics, pretty important. Google Analytics or Mixpanel. We built our own in-house analytics platform. It's not that difficult if you are willing to invest, and there's a lot of tutorials on this. We use Kafka for messaging, then we dump stuff into Elasticsearch, and we visualize it with Grafana, and then we let our data scientists go wild with machine learning. And we, for performance testing, we use Xcode and Android Studio, and we also open sourced uh, a tool that, that you can use. So that's the tools, but you know, these are just things. They're, they're, I, I wanted to leave with something a bit more uh, than, than just a tool, a bit of an appreciation, understanding of, of testing. And I tried to figure out what is testing. I mean, I've seen a lot of tests. I've seen it at Uber. I've seen it elsewhere. I've seen it work. I've seen it not work. So, and, and there are some, some frameworks out there. So I came up with something called, that I call the continuous testing pyramid. Raise your hand if you've heard of the testing pyramid for. Cool, and, and raise your hand if, if you haven't, just for exercise. Not, not for, great. So in, in testing, there's this pretty popular thing called the testing pyramid, and it, it, this is not the testing pyramid, but the testing pyramid says unit tests, integration tests, and end-to-end -end tests. For mobile, I took the liberty of changing this to unit tests, UI tests, and manual tests. And what this says is, the lower the things are in, in the stack, unit tests are easy to write and cheap to write and cheap to maintain. You can have a bunch of them, and they're pretty, pretty stable. If you, you have to change that specific piece of code for them to break. UI tests, more expensive to write. They will break more easily. You can change any part of your system, and a UI test can break. Manual tests are kind of expensive because you need a person to run it, and you can't run it every, on every single check-in. So the conventional wisdom is that you want to have a lot of the, the unit tests, a lot more than the UI tests, and fewer manual tests. And you, the more important something is, the more you test it. If, if you have your core flow, like for us at Uber, taking a ride, we have a manual test, we have UI tests, we have unit tests on that. Another thing that comes at Uber is dog fooding. Uh, and if your company can afford this, that's a great way to have an extended manual test. And one thing that the test experiment never shows on is, is the kind of foundation it needs to build on for it to be successful. And, and my personal opinion, what I've seen, if you have code users and continuous integration, you have a stable base. Without this, your pyramid will, will, will be a bit more wobbly. And then things do go wrong. You know, a lot of people think I'm done with the testing pyramid and, and testing is great, but things go wrong and you need to monitor, you need to alert, you need to triage your user feedback, and you need to have some sort of postmortems that will fix your system. And this works for any team size. But if you want to make things scale, if you have more people, more functionality, more lines of code, you grow by 10x, you need to do a few things here. First and most important, you need to have a team to own the infrastructure. You need it, otherwise it will not work. The best thing that we did at Uber was hire our first uh, tooling hire, I think when we had about 15 or 10 or 15 mobile engineers, and that team has grown stably. We're, we're more than 20 people just doing tooling who don't write tests, they just make sure this, this has a solid base. It always runs, always works. They optimize for performance and so on. And then you need to turn to your engineers. And this doesn't, it doesn't really matter if you have a QA function or not. You need every person who writes code to do some of the things. You need everyone to do code reviews. You need everyone to write unit tests. You need everyone, all engineers, to write UI tests. And you need all teams to do their manual tests. Again, you can have dedicated teams but then it makes sure that you scale them appropriately. What I found personally is it's great when engineers do code reviews and, and unit tests. They, they check their part of the code. UI tests are few and far in between, and, and it's nice when they can do that. And, and it's important that engineers do this because UI tests, unit tests, and code reviews are all before you get to master. 
and the teams should decide what do you want to test manually. You are the best person to know it. The CTO will not know it. I will not know what the other team should do. You will know it. And all employees, if possible, do dog fooding. You know, uh, hopefully you can do this in your company. And finally, every single team to monitor what's going wrong and improve your systems. Do this in principle using the tools that you either buy, you either put in place that you need, and you will have a continuous, you, you will have a culture, a testing culture that will scale. So I'd like to you know, close with the, my original question, why do we test? It's to minimize business impact, but balance it with execution speed. And as you scale, when you iterate on the tools you use, your team structure and the processes, to keep doing this, you'll be just fine, even if you do something completely different to us. So with that, thanks for your attention. I mentioned that we open source some of our testing tools, and that's lists up here. And let's open it up for a Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are covering a lot in your speech. Uh, still, we have some questions, or perhaps because of this, we have a lot of questions. Uh, you can see on the screen as well, but first says, you said you test mobile apps manually. Which devices do you cover, and how much time do you spend doing this manual testing? Or do you outsource all? Yeah, so we do two things. Uh, the teams are responsible for testing their, running their science tests manually, and we just, we, we, we don't really worry too much about the different devices that we use at that point. So we just use some of the most popular ones. Uh, if we're before a big launch, we might test with some older ones. We also do, as a company, we do do exploratory testing that we do outsource because when you repeat the same test, it's a bit more different. Uh, we sometimes might look at testing different devices. We probably just take the most popular ones. For Android, you cannot test all of that. We monitor and we see what our customers see in different countries. So above a certain size, I, I think it's a bit fruitless to do it. The only time we do very thorough testing with a lot of devices we can get our hands on it before a big release, before we release the new driver app that we just did or the new rider app. Makes sense. Uh, who creates rules for Herald? Is it a kind of a team and organization documentation? If you can give more details. Yeah, yeah. So, so good to your question on, on, on Herald. Again, this is a, something that comes with Fabricator, and it's just a rule engine. Uh, I'm not sure GitHub has something similar, but it, it might be possible to put things in place. Uh, the beauty of Herald is teams just do and, and put these in, in, in place. We have a concept of ownership. Whenever you own a piece of code, you are encouraged to put whatever Herald view you want to put in place. Typically, the way this works is you release your code, you see someone either made a change and they didn't ask for a review, and you put in a Herald rule where you see, I want my team to be notified. Um, we see two teams making really a lot of Herald rules, teams who, who built some of these platform components that a lot of teams use, and also some uh, teams that, that just own a very specific piece of code. So with my team, we, we talked about, because it's Herald rules are so common, we talk about, hey, what Herald rules should we define? And we maintain it as a team. Now, sometimes you see that some Herald rules add like blocking reviewers and they don't, no one acts on it. Uh, we might contact the team and, and, and clean it up. So again, it's, it's very much based on engineers do this, not managers. And it scales pretty well. OK. So uh, what kind of feature flag implementation are you using? Is it a full e fully in-house solution? And what are the most important features of it? Yep, so unfortunately for people in the audience, it is fully in-house. And the reason we did fully in-house, at the time when we started, this has been with Uber for at least three or four years. Uh, we didn't find anything out there that, that we thought worked well. And it's a, it's a solution where it started out as a feature flag system, and it also got merged into an experimentation platform, because with feature flags, you can just control staging role as well as run experiments. So with feature flagging, we, we, we are able to target based on, uh, sorry, uh, one, one other reason we, need, we built it. We're big, really big on cities, so we can target based on cities uh, and on devices and, and, and version numbers. So we can target where to roll out, what city. Uh, and we can also target based on do we want to roll out for, for users or for a population. And then on top of it, we built a lot of experimentation. Uh, we, built, we, we wrote some things about in our, on our uh, engineering block. So if you search for Uber experimentation, uh, system, uh, you will find a, a more article. We put a lot of visualization, etc., uh, in it, and it's a pretty neat uh, feature. 
I personally, I see there's a lot of startups doing feature flags these days, and I think they're starting to get better. Uh, I, when it comes to this thing, if, the, if, if you can do it, you, you will usually do it yourself because you'll find you want these bells and whistles. That's what I found. Okay, and perhaps the question what helps you to clarify a few things. So, where, oh, yeah. Oh, that question I wanted to ask has Where, where are we doing performance testing? Yes. So, anyway. So where are you doing performance testing since you store test and production data in the same place? It's not a question actually I wanted to ask, but anyway, let's go with this All one right, for now. Let's, let's go with this question. Um, so uh, we do performance testing on, I'll talk about the mobile, the back end we do load testing and uh, that, that can be, so I'll, I'll answer both, back end and mobile. A mobile, we, we, we can do it locally where you can, we can just test and, and have some tracing. We, we open source the tool or, tools around that. And then we also do it on devices. We actually sample. So and sometimes when you run an Uber app, you might have the app sample your usage. We do it very rarely, but that's where we get the, the data from real devices. So that's where we do it. And then locally, we have debug tools to actually trace these things. On our production systems, we actually sometimes, uh, we, we can use test tenancies. So uh, we still test with test data, but on a production system. So we can do load testing as such. And sometimes we do this cheeky thing called hailstorming. Uh, uh, sorry, not, not hailstorming, but we, at least on payment systems, we sometimes we're able to delay certain non-important things like payment information for, let's say, an hour, and then launch it to our system in a minute. Things that people don't care about if you're being charged now or, or, or in an hour. And then we see how our system crumbles. Oh, smart. Okay, we are running out of time. Thank you very much for coming and sharing all this knowledge for, uh, with us. Please take this small gift. And th again, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. <laughs> Thank you for your time and you can find me on Twitter uh, after here as well as I'll link.